So we're going to review just for a moment what we did on Friday. So what was it that on Friday? Limits at infinity, right? Okay, just to remind you of what it is that we were doing. Okay, so as an example, as an example, how about, how about, let's think about this. Yeah, for example, the limit as x goes to infinity of the sine of x. Now, we'll do something simple, simpler first, just to remind you. 4x plus 10 over uh, let's say 5x minus x squared plus 3. Okay, so what do you think? What do you think? <coughs> so what we should do is we should factor out the highest order term in the denominator. What is the highest order term in the denominator? x squared. So we should factor x squared out of the numerator and also the denominator. So let's factor it out of both. So the limit as x goes to infinity. I'll factor the denominator first since that's a little bit easier, maybe. So then x squared multiplied by 5 over x minus 1 plus 3 over x squared. So you can see I factored x squared out of the denominator. <coughs> what if you get if you factor x squared out of the numerator? Yes, 4 over x plus 10 over x squared. Now, can you cancel the x squared over x squared? <coughs> yes, why can you do that? Because we're going to infinity. So that means that we can assume that the x is greater than 0. You can assume it's greater than any number that you wish, including 0. Okay, so then 4 over x plus 10 over x squared divided by 5 over x minus 1 plus 3 over x squared. So then now, each one of these terms, do you know the limit of each one? Yes, how about what's the limit of 4 over x? 0. What's the limit of 10 over x squared? Also 0. How about the limit of 5 over x? 0. What's the limit of negative 1? Negative 1. <laughs> Everybody's quiet. Okay, so then the limit of 3 over x squared? 0, right? So then what is this expression altogether equal to? 0. Wonderful. Okay, so I think it's great if you're able to look at this expression and tell what its limit is without actually performing this computation. I think it's great if you have that intuition. This computation is what's being graded, and if you do not provide it, you will be given a zero. So is there any question concerning that? <coughs> okay. How about another one that's interesting? The limit as x goes to uh, the limit as x goes to infinity of the sine of x over x. So you know one that looks like this, but isn't this one? Right? What is the one that looks like this, but isn't this one? It's the limit of something something x goes to something of sine of x over x. So the one that you know is that when x is going to where? Zero. You know when it's going to zero. And in this case, if it's going to zero, the limit is one. Good. That's the one you know. So this one is not the same one because now we're going to infinity. It's not the same. So what do you think about it? Hmm. So all those rules that you knew before, they still apply. Ah, that was what I was trying to hear, the squeeze theorem. Right? The squeeze theorem, because look, negative uh, 1 is less than or equal to the sine of x is less than or equal to 1. Right? The sine of x is between negative 1 and 1. doesn't matter what x is. 
So then now I can divide everything by x and get negative 1 over x is less than or equal to the sine of x over x. is less than or equal to 1 over x, but this is only true when what? When x is greater than 0. Can I assume that x is greater than 0? Yeah, because we're going to infinity. I can assume it's greater than anything. Okay, so then now, this means that the limit as x goes to infinity of negative 1 over x must be less than or equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of the sine of x over x which in turn must be less than or equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x. Okay, so now I have the limit that I want that is bound, it's bounded between two other limits. Do I know what both of those two other limits are? What's the limit of 1 over x? Zero. What's the limit of negative 1 over x? Negative zero. <laughs> right, zero. So then, this one is zero. Right, that's zero, and this one is zero. So the conclusion is that the limit that we are looking for is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to zero. So there's only one possibility. What is it? It is exactly zero. Okay, so then this, the use of this inequality right here Right, this is an example of using the squeeze theorem. Or the sandwich theorem, or whatever. Okay, so any example about this? Okay, so any questions about limits at infinity before we go on to something else? Okay, something else. The something else is section 3.7 optimization problems. So I have good news and bad news. The good news is that we're not actually learning anything new today. We're just applying things that we've already learned. The bad news is that we are applying them to word problems and the phrase word problems usually strikes fear into the heart of a student. Okay. So does everyone understand the context of where we are? We're not doing anything new. We're applying what we already know to word problems. Okay. <coughs> so then, <coughs> what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, an example. I'm going to say that we're going to make a box. Okay, we're going to make a box and we have just a fixed amount of cardboard. We're going to make a cardboard box. So then, you could make a box from a fixed amount of cardboard having a lot of different geometries. You know, you could make a flat box like a pizza box. Right? It'd be flat like a pizza box. You could make it really tall and skinny, tall and skinny so that you could put like a pull cue in it. Right? A really tall and skinny box. So you can make it tall and skinny, you can make it a cube, you can make it like a pizza box. And the question is, is if you have a fixed amount of surface area, if you have a fixed amount of surface area, what box contains the maximum volume? So does everyone understand the question? Okay, so that's the question we're going to answer. <coughs> okay. So, for example, given <coughs> 108 square units, of surface area find the box with maximum volume which has a square base okay so a box and I'm giving you the additional constraint that the base the base of the box has to be square. Okay, so an example might be like a pizza box that has a square base. Right, a pizza box which has a square base, the, the length and the width of the box are the same, but it's not very tall, it's just tall enough to hold a pizza, it has a certain volume. Okay, another example would be the pull cue box, right, where it has a very small square base and it's very, very tall and you could put a long stick in it. 
Okay, so does everyone understand the question? So find the box with maximum volume. So then you should always start out drawing a picture. Okay, so then here's my attempt to draw a three-dimensional picture. Okay. <laughs> Pretty good for me. Okay, so then I drew a box. So then we need to come up with some names for the dimension. So what do you want to call this dimension? Okay, we'll call that one X. What do you want to call this one? W, okay. And what do you want to call this one? H. Okay, fine. So then what is the formula for the volume? So first off, volume. What do you want to call, what, what symbolic name do you want to give volume? V, that's a good choice, right? Don't be too creative. V is uh, X, W, H. So you know some, you know another, this is a relationship between V, X, W, and H, but you know another relationship between just H, X, and W, and what relationship is that? Sorry? X and W are equal, and why is that? Because it says a square base. So we also know that X is equal to W because it says a square base. Right? And this means that you could say that the volume is X squared H. So is everybody with me on, on that account? All right. <coughs> So then another thing we know, we know another thing about surface area. Okay, so then what symbolic name do you want to give to surface area? A, okay, that sounds good. So A, now how many faces does a box have? Six faces. It has six faces, so your surface area should look like the sum of six things. Okay, so then what is the area of the base? X squared. What is the area of the top? X squared, right? <laughs> what is the area of the front face, the face that is facing you? XH. And the one behind it? XH. And the one on the right? XH. And the one on the left? XH. So can you see that it looks like the surface area looks like the sum of six things? Good. So then after some simplification, you can say that A is 2X squared plus 4XH. So does everybody agree with the analysis so far? Does everybody agree with the analysis so far? So now what we need to do <coughs> before we go any further, we need to consider we need to consider uh, there is one other thing we know about the surface area, and what is that? Sorry? Yeah, it's 108, right? So A is 108. So now what we need to do is we need to consider uh, the feasible domains of these things. Okay, so anytime you do an optimization problem, you have to make a statement about domain. So then let's consider X first the value x. What is, the what is a reasonable domain that we can make on x? Has to be greater than 0, right? Has to be greater than 0. Can it be equal to 0? Can it be equal to 0? Ah, but it can be equal to 0. Why could it be equal to 0? Oh, no, wait. No, no, no. Not with it. I agree now. I agree. Not with the surface area of 108. Because what happens? What would happen if it was zero? It would cease to be a box at all. It would be a straight line of infinite length, which has no surface area. All right, so x has to be strictly greater than zero. Okay, what about the domain for h? Greater than or equal to zero. Right? 
equal to zero, it can, it can be equal to zero because you can still have surface area 108, right? Then it wouldn't be a box, it would be a sheet of paper, okay? Which wouldn't be too interesting because such a box would have what volume? Zero, right? And that's probably not the maximum volume, right? So does everybody understand the domain restrictions in the problem? So then now, now we can state what the mathematical problem is. The mathematical problem now is maximize A. No, maximize V subject to A is 108. Okay, so then now let's, let's write down the volume function. Volume is x squared h. So currently, volume is a function of how many variables? Two variables. Now this class is the calculus of functions of one variable. So what should we do? Shall we give up? Maybe, this is, maybe I just made a mistake. Like I, I, I grabbed the wrong book. This, this was for a different class. Maybe <laughs> people are liking this. People are starting to vote. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is what, has what happened. No, no. What we need to do is we need to make volume a function of just one variable. Of just one variable. So then how can I somehow eliminate x or h? Sorry? Ah, use the surface area equation. Okay, so then if I take the surface area equation, area is 2x squared plus 4xh, and that has to be 108. It has to be 108. So then that is to say that we have this equation, 2x squared plus 4xh is 108. Okay, so then now, of the two variables that are in this equation, which one seems easier to solve for? h, so then let us solve for it. If we do that, then h is 108 minus 2x squared divided by 4x. After simplification, what? Uh, 25, 7, so 27 x to the negative 1 and then minus 1 half x, like so. So that's what h is. So then now I can use that expression I can use that expression and rewrite V. I can say that V is equal to X squared multiplied by 27X to the negative one minus one half X, right? X squared H. So now I can multiply this through and say that V is uh, what? 27X minus one half X cubed. Okay, so is there any question on how we got here? So this is the volume function. Right? And now, now that we have performed this algebraic procedure, how many variables is the volume function? One, it is one variable. So then, now we have all of the tools that are available to us, right? Because this, is, this class is the calculus of functions of one variable. The calculus of functions of one variable. Now you have two means to optimize such a function. You can either use the extreme value theorem or you can use uh, where you find critical numbers and verify that you, you can either use the first derivative test or the second derivative test. So then now, in what case do you use the extreme value theorem? When the domain is closed and bounded, right? Remember, the extreme value theorem says that the extreme values occur either at boundary points or at interior critical points. So then, now, is the domain closed and bounded? No, the domain is not closed and bounded. Domain is not closed and bounded. That is to say, it does not look like this, A to B. If it was A to B closed at A and B, then you could use the extreme value theorem. But 
it's not, so we cannot use the extreme value theorem. But that's okay. We'll just find critical numbers and verify that it's concave what? We want to find a maximizer, so if we find where the derivative is zero, the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is negative, then this would be, we would be able to verify that this is a maximizer. Right? Okay, good. So then the domain is not closed and bounded. So then now, let's compute the derivative. So V prime, what is V prime in this question? So 27 minus 3 halves x squared. Okay. Now, is there, we want to find the critical numbers. <coughs> the critical numbers. So is there anywhere, is there anywhere that V prime is undefined? Okay, no, no x values. Okay, is there anywhere that V prime is, what's the other place you look for? Where it's zero. Okay, so is there anywhere where it's zero? And the answer is probably. <laughs> probably, right? So then let's solve the equation. 27 minus 3 halves x squared is zero. So that's the same as saying that x squared is, uh, what, 27 multiplied by two-thirds. Okay, so then 27 multiplied, oop, 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 oop. 27 multiplied by two-thirds is nine multiplied by two, which is 18. So x squared is 18. So x is negative the square root of 18, or x is positive the square root of 18. But one of these does not belong. Something's not right. My answer is not agreeing with the book currently. So somewhere I made an algebraic mistake. Twenty-seven two x squared plus four x h. I only use five faces. The book only used five faces. No, the book. Oh, okay. Okay, my answer is okay. So then. That's fine. The book, the book, they did a question where the box was open on the top so that there only had five faces. So my, my ans my, mine is different than the book. It doesn't matter. Okay, so then now, w still, one of these doesn't belong. <laughs> right, this one does not belong. Why does this one not belong? Okay, it doesn't belong for two reasons, which are really the same reason. One reason is that we already said the domain is positive. That reason alone is, is sufficient to say that that one doesn't belong. Finally, what, what is the domain at all, right? The domain was a physical consideration. Is this going to be a box with a negative dimension? Imagine if you had a box with a negative dimension, right? If I had a box, if this book, right, looking at it as a box, if it had a negative dimension, then I could take another book just like it and put it on top of it, and then both books would disappear because they would annihilate each other. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so then, there's only one critical number. It's at the square root of 18. Now, a critical number could be a relative minimizer, it could be a relative maximizer, it could be nothing whatsoever. So then, we need to verify, we need to verify that x is the square root of 18 is a maximizer. Okay, so someone described to me how to do that. I already said it aloud once. Use the second derivative test. Okay, so then we'll use second derivative. Okay, so the second derivative, V double prime. So the first derivative was was what? 27 minus 3 halves x squared. And the derivative of that will be negative 3x. Negative 3x. So then if I evaluate the second derivative at the square root of 18, then this is negative 3 square root of 18. And what is significant about that? It's negative. It's negative, and so what this is telling you is that this graph is concave down like a frown right there. So then, 
what that's telling you is that x equal to the square root of 18 is a maximizer. Okay, so then finally, you need to write your conclusion. You need to write your conclusion. So then the dimensions are x is the square root of 18, but we also need to know what h is. Okay, so then how do you figure out what h is? Ah, you plug it into this thing we made way back up at the top somewhere. Where is it? Right there. Okay, so if you plug in very carefully, then you obtain what? So 27 over the square root of 18 and then minus one half of the square root of 18. Okay, now under normal circumstances, under normal circumstances, I wouldn't want you to simplify. I wouldn't want you to do that, but this is not a normal circumstance, so I wanna go ahead and do it. <coughs> okay, so then who has a good guess of what probably it's going to simplify into? Anybody guess? So how about this? We want to find an optimal box. Right? What kind of optimal box has the maximum volume? So what do you think? A square, but well, sort of, but that, that's it, right? A cube, right? <clears throat> okay, so then let's see, right? The square root of 18, well, that's 18 is 2 times 9. Right, so then the square root of 18 is actually 3 square root 2. So this is 27 over 3 square root of 2 minus uh, 1 half times the square root of 18. And so this is what? <coughs> H is 9 over the square root of 2 minus 1 half the square root of 18. Okay, so now I guess I rationalize this, right? If I rationalize 9 over the square root of 2, that is to say I'll multiply it by the square root of 2 divided by the square root of 2, then I get, what, 9 the square root of 2 over 2 minus 18 over, uh, excuse me, the square root of 18 over 2. And so then 9 square root 2 minus uh, how much? 3 square root 2 over 2 is 6 square root 2. <laughs> over 2, which is 3 square root of 2, which is the square root of 18. So what is that telling you? Right, this tells you that the optimal shape is a cube. And then finally, what is the volume? Volume is V is equal to X squared H, which is the square root of 18 cubed, which is, which is anybody's guess. Right? We'll just leave it like that. <coughs> Yes? Please, please speak loudly. No, no, I, I care basically nil about radicals in the denominator, or fractional exponents. I'm not concerned about that <coughs> in any way. Other questions? Okay, so then that's interesting, right? The optimal shape was a cube. So then how about this? Um, if, if it didn't have to be the shape of a cube at all, right? It could be any shape. It could be shaped like a banana or whatever. What shape has the maximum volume for a fixed amount of surface area? A sphere. A sphere, right? So then if, if we just had 108 square 
inches of surface area and you wanted to maximize the volume and there was no constraint whatsoever on the shape, right? Because the constraint here was that it had to be a box. If there was no constraint whatsoever on the shape, then the optimal shape would be a sphere. The optimal shape would be a sphere. And you should keep in mind a lot of these optimal things, right? And I think it's excellent if you were able to look at this problem and know, ah, the optimal shape is a box, is a, is a cube. Okay, I think it's great if you knew that. However, if you just say the optimal shape is a box, I don't even care if you're right. You're not going to get any, any points whatsoever because this is a calculus class. This is not a philosophy class. This is about calculus. If you don't use the methods of calculus, then you have not satisfied the requirements of the course. Okay, so any questions? <coughs> okay, so let's do another example. <coughs> okay, so here's an interesting one. <clears throat> okay, so then at this point right here, at this point right here, nope. Zero two. Okay, now we have a parabola that looks like so. Okay, now, the question is, I'm going to give you the equation of this parabola in just a moment, but the question is, what is the minimum distance from the parabola to that point? Right, what's the minimum distance? So, for example, if I was to put a point right here, then do you think the pink point is the closest point on the parabola to the red point? No, at least according to my eye, I can see some places that are closer. I can see some places that are closer. Okay, so then, now I have another question for you. Let's say that this pink point was actually the closest point, just for sake of argument. Would it be the only closest point? No, if this, if this pink point was the point I was looking for, then there would be another one. Where would it be? On the other side, right? So then now... The question is, is we want to find the point on the parabola that's closest to the red point. Can you see that, that there almost certainly are going to be more than one solution? Okay. So then now, that's the point zero 02. That is the point zero 02. And the parabola is this. Y is equal to 4 minus X squared. <coughs> y is equal to 4 minus X squared. So the way we're going to understand this question is as follows, is I'm going to say that the pink point is some point x, y. And I'm going to move, I'm going to move uh, the pink point around. I can move it to anywhere I want. And as I move it, its x value and its y value changes. Okay, so then what is the distance? I'm going to move the, this to the other side. <coughs> What is this distance that I'm drawing here? So if I call this, if I call that thing D, then what is an expression for D? But what's the distance between any x, y and the point 0, 2? Right, it is the square root, the square root of x minus 0 squared plus y minus 2 squared. That's just the distance formula. Okay, the distance formula. So then now, I'm going to make another observation. I'm going to say that, well, um, what we want to do is we want to minimize d. That's what we want to do. But, this is a standard math trick for those of you that are physics majors or math majors. So then you'll see this kind of thing happening all the time. I, you want to minimize the distance, d. Well, that's the same as minimizing d squared. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. It, and so then you might say, then, then why do it at all? And the answer is the computation becomes significantly less complicated. So what we're going to do is we are going to minimize 
d squared subject to subject to what what is the constraint where can the pink point move along the parabola so what is the constraint which says the pink point has to be on the parabola y is 4 minus x squared right it can't I can't move the pink point just anywhere right? I can't just move it anywhere I wish it has to be on the parabola right so then this this thing is saying it has to be on the parabola okay so if we're going to do that let's find a let's find an expression for d squared and I'll call that big D big D is d squared so then big D is x squared plus y minus 2 squared okay now big D big D is a function of how many variables two but this is the calculus of functions of one variable which means we somehow need to transform D big D into a function of one variable so how can I go about doing that right I can substitute Y so then big D big D is x squared plus 4 minus x squared uh, 4 minus x squared minus 2 squared like so and so then now D is x squared plus what 2 minus x squared squared okay so now we have a function of one variable now we have a function of one variable and you could multiply this out if you wish but I'm not sure it's going to be necessary yet okay now what we should make considerations about the domain we should make considerations about the domain Oh, you're killing me, machine. Okay, so the, the thing's going to crash. So then now while it's crashing, tell me about the domain. <coughs> okay, so X can be anything whatsoever. What about Y? What about Y? Oh, where is it? So, the, so I'll give you a hint. It's not the same story with Y. Right? Why? What is the tallest point of the parabola? <laughs> Four, right? So then the parabola can't be any higher. So then now the domain, domain, the domain is that x can be anything, and y has to be less than or equal to 4. okay so then now we're optimizing over x so is that a closed and bounded interval no it's not closed and bounded so we cannot use the what we cannot use the extreme value theorem so we can't use the extreme value theorem so we'll do the same thing we did last time we'll find critical numbers and then use the second derivative test okay so then the first derivative so let's say it like this we cannot use the extreme value theorem so then we'll do critical numbers and the second derivative test okay so as for the critical numbers the first derivative is what 2x plus 2 times 2 minus x squared multiplied by negative 2x Okay, so any question about why that's the derivative? Okay, so that was, I had to use the chain rule to accomplish that. <clears throat> okay, so then now, if your only task was to compute the derivative, I would say in there, but now we're about to start doing algebraic things with the derivative, so I'm going to algebraically simplify it as much as I am able. So then d prime is 2x... Uh, and then minus 4x multiplied by 2 minus x squared. Okay, so then d prime is 2x minus 8x 
and then plus 4x cubed. Does that sound right? Wonderful. So then one more, d prime is 4x cubed minus 6x. Okay, so any question about how we got there? Okay, so then as for critical numbers, what two kinds of conditions give critical numbers? Undefined and zero. So then how about is there anywhere that d prime is undefined? No. Is there anywhere that d prime is zero? And the answer is probably. <laughs> okay, so then we want to say 4x cubed minus 6x is zero. I can see a common factor of 2x, so I'll say that 2x multiplied by uh, what? Multiplied by x, what am I saying? 2x squared minus 3 is zero. 2x squared minus 3 is zero. Okay, so then there are two possi uh, there are multiple possibilities. Right, we could have that 2x is zero or x squared is 3 halves. So then there are now these possibilities. x is 0 or x is negative the square root of 3 over 2 or x is positive the square root of 3 over 2. Okay, so does everybody see that there are three options? Okay, and we want to find the minimum distance. Minimum distance. So <clears throat> we need to test to see. Uh, we're going to use the second derivative test now. So let's verify these are minimizers. So then the second derivative, the second derivative, will be 12x squared minus 6. Twelve x squared minus 6. Okay, so then the second derivative evaluated at 0 is what? Negative 6. Okay, which in particular is negative. That's negative. So then what kind of concavity is there? Concave, negative people smiling or frowning. Frowning, right? Concave downing. Okay, so then x equal to zero, that's a relative what? A relative max. Was that what we were looking for? No, no, no. No, no, no. We weren't looking for any relative maxes. Okay, so it's a good thing we checked, right? <laughs> be a good, you know, that would be like saying, you know, your boss says, I want you to minimize our cost. And you say, here it is. <laughs> I found a critical number where we're maximizing our cost. Okay, that would that would not be good. Okay, so then the second derivative evaluated at negative the square root of three over two. Okay, well then that is what twelve multiplied by three over two minus six. So then that's eighteen minus six, and that's twelve, which is positive. So what kind of concavity is that? Up, like a cup, right? So then is that a minimizer? Yes, it's a minimizer. We were looking for that. Okay, similarly, the second derivative evaluated at the positive square root of 3 over 2 is also 12, which is positive, which is concave up, and so we were looking for that one too. Okay, but now we want to find the minimizer. We found two different minimizers. We found two different minimizers, so now we need to check. Maybe one of them is more minimal than the other. Right? Maybe one of them is better. So how do we check that? Now we plug it back into the original function. If one of them is less than the other, then that's the one we're looking for. Okay, so the original function d, the original function d, uh, let's copy it from the top there. That was this thing. <coughs> OK, 
Okay, so there it is. So we are interested in what's happening at the square root of 3 over 2 and negative square root of 3 over 2. Okay, so negative square root of 3 over 2. Okay, so then squared, that will be 3, uh, 3 over 2. And then plus 2 minus 3 over 2 squared. So that's 3 over 2 plus, now that's 4 halves minus 3 halves is 1 half squared is 1 fourth. So 3 halves plus 1 fourth is 6 fourths plus 1 fourth is 7 fourths. So the distance, that distance was 7 fourths. Okay, now this distance, at the other optimal point we found, the positive square root of 3 over 2, you go through the exact same sequence of operations and you obtain that it's 7 fourths. So you get 7 fourths in both places. So what's the answer? They're both minimizers. Right? Now someone tell me why this makes perfectly legitimate sense. Because it's parabola, right? We drew the picture and we said, before we did any computations whatsoever, we said, shouldn't there be, if we find one point, shouldn't there be a symmetric point also? Right? We made that observation at the very beginning. So then, what we found was what we expected, right? There was a point about right here where the distance is minimal. And isn't there one on the opposite side right here also? Yes, right? Here. Okay, so these are these are the optimal points, the orange ones. Now, what was the other point we found that was not optimal? Zero, right? It's at the very top right here. So what's happening is, what's happening is, is right here the distance is minimal at the orange point. And then as you go from the orange point to the next orange point, the, the distance increases to this point and then decreases to the orange point. So right here, this is a relative max. Now I have a question, is it the absolute maximum distance? No, it's just a relative maximum distance because, for example, if I take the pink point and I let it go all the way down as far as I want on the parabola, I can make the distance arbitrarily large. Okay, so then the distance to the gray point is a relative max. The distance to the orange points, that's the minimum for the whole problem. So any question about these? All of these questions require you to write multiple equations Okay, they require you to figure out which one you are trying to optimize. Okay, that one will always need to be written as a function of exactly one variable. There is calculus for functions of more variables, but this class is the calculus of functions of one variable. Okay, so then you always need to write a conclusion, because if you don't write a conclusion, then the grader can only assume that after all of that work, you were not able to make a conclusion. Okay, finally, whatever critical numbers or whatever you find, you have to verify that they were what you were looking for. So, for example, maybe the maximizer is at 3, and you find that there is a critical number at 3. Good job. If you don't demonstrate that it's a maximizer, then the only thing the grader can assume is that you did not know that you were even supposed to do that, or you were unable to do it. Okay, so if I say maximize, you find a critical number, you demonstrate it's a maximizer. If I say minimize, you demonstrate it's a minimizer. So any questions about this? See you on Wednesday. <coughs>